Well, hello everyone. Great to have you all here. Welcome to Gladwell Academy's webinar series. Today's webinar is about emerging from COVID-19 safely. Our today's hosts are Anand Muthiraj and Nidhi Chopra. Anand is a leader with a vision to bring in great difference and excellence in the organization. He has conducted 42 implementing safe classes across four continents. And our second host is Nidhi Chopra, who is a seasoned agile trainer and coach with extensive experience in helping senior executives and leadership teams with their transformation journey. She has more than 12 years of experience in agile way of working. So these are today's. And before we start, I would like to mention that you can ask your questions in the chat window below. And all your questions will be answered by Anand and Nidhi at the end of this webinar. So I would say just relax and enjoy this webinar. Nidhi, handing it over to you. Thank you very much, Kieran, uh, for the introduction. And um, hello and welcome, everyone. I mean, um, I think we're, it's, um, we have a beautiful, beautiful audience today with the people joining from everywhere, from Netherlands, from India, from Singapore, from US. So we are quite glad to be here all together to talk about the emerging crisis where we are in currently and how we can together um, you know, come up with some strategies and come up with some ideas to overcome those crises, uh, overcome this crisis. So thank you again for uh, being here today. Um, so before we actually start this, I I'd like to ask you all, does, does anyone remember Nokia? Just say yes if you do. And if you remember the slogan of Nokia, Put it in the chat window if you do. Because it was quite prominent back then. Nokia had a very good slogan. I still remember it. When I say Nokia, the slogan just comes up in my head. So if you do, please put it in the chat window. Oh yeah, I see. Thank you, Anand, uh, for mentioning connecting people. And that was it. I mean, Nokia was quite famous when we, when we started. I don't know, my first phone was Nokia. Um, don't know about you. So you can see the slide here. I'd like to ask what's common among all these companies? Anyone wants to, if you, if you have ideas or if you want to take a guess, please do put it in the chat window that, yeah, absolutely. I have a, I have a response from Rohan that all companies fail to understand changing market. And that really is, um, you know, the gist of it, that all companies did, you know, fail to understand, they fail to innovate, they fail to disrupt. And that's what our next slide is all about, um, disruption. So, you know, I, I'm not going to ask here um, what disruption is, because I think we all know, we all have seen disruption happening around us, but I'd actually like to ask you all, what's the difference between disruption and innovation? And if you, sorry, I mean, you can write in the chat window, but also feel free to raise your hand and talk to us. It'll be really nice to hear your views. So if you, if you want to answer this, uh, feel free to raise your hand and then, you know, we'll, we'll go through the, we'll unmute and uh, would be lovely to hear your views. What you think is the difference between disruption and innovation. Okay, so Anand, you'd like to add something about disruption and innovation, the difference really? Disruption is a is a is a process that's been existing always, and innovation is also a process that's kind of existing. What disruption does is it disrupts the market. It takes a small technology or it takes a small idea and disrupts markets in such a way that it makes it available for larger number of people to do. And innovation is a concept where you take an idea and get it into the market. Maybe innovation at some point in time can become a disruption in the market. I quite agree. I thank you for adding your two cents here. I quite agree with you. And I think, you know, um, I, I always see as innovation as your power tool, as your power tool to disrupt others. And adding on to what Anand just said, innovation is something that you can take to the market. So that is your power tool to disrupt others. Or it can also act as a shield to prevent you from being disrupted. Because if you're not innovating continuously, then you are likely to get disrupted. Yeah. 
Um, and that brings us to, yes, Anand. So how do you kill a giant is the first question. How do you kill a giant? These are three large giants. If you go back to the various fairy tale stories that you've seen in the, in the past when you heard as a kids, most of the times you see giants are killed by small kids. And that's the phenomena of, you know, of disruptive innovation. You do not disrupt one big corporate will not come and disrupt a large big corporate. Generally, it doesn't work that way. A large corporation is slowly eaten by a small starter company. And that's how disruption starts. Let's look at an example of how disruption started in the steel industry in the US. It was sometime in 1975. There, are, there was these large steel integrated mills that were manufacturing four different types of steels. The first type of steel was called concrete reinforcing rebar steel. And these were the kind of steel that you would put inside the concrete to make your concrete hard when you build structures. The second one is called as the angle iron and uh, rods and bars. The third one is called structural steel. And the, fifth, or the fourth one is called as the sheet steel. As you go from bottom to top, the quality of steel goes up. If you look at the concrete steel, the gross margins are only 7%. So what happened was there was this small companies called mini mills. So mini mills is something like in a area of 10 feet by 10 feet, you can create two small furnaces there. That's the kind of a small scale equipment that mini mills started. They started using all this scrap steel and they started smelting these steels, making it a liquid and then creating something called concrete reinforcing rebar steel. The cost, then, the cost at which they brought in was so low of course, the quality was also low. Now, what happened because of this is that the large corporations could not think of creating like a startup. They wanted to say, no, we can't run this show. So they fled the market. They told Minimals, oh guys, take it. You can take it and we will not want to do because in the US it's called as the doggy dog business, running, an organ, running a business with 7% gross margin. When you have other business lines, which kind of gives you 25, 30% margins. So the large corporations fled. Now what happened with the minimals? The minimals started doing steel, started pushing into the market. Instead of one, there were 20 or 30 minimals started. The 30, there are 40 minimals that started. What happened was the price of, of rebar steel hit the rock bottom. With the price at the rock bottom, the minimals could not produce steel and they started looking up. They said, why don't we go and hit the angle iron rods and bar steel? They started slowly coming up to that market. When they came to that market, the large integrated steel mills started looking at it and said, we don't want to do this doggy dog business because it's only 15% profit. And they said, let's look at the structural steel and the sheet steel. The process repeated. What happened was this, the minimal started producing the angle iron rods and bars. Naturally, the price fell down. Of course, there was competition. Because there was competition, they had to survive. They started looking up and they looked at structural steel. They came to structural steel. However, the integrated steel mill said, we can't do this. We will flood the, free the market. They said, anyway, we have, uh, we have sheet steel that gives us 25, 30% gross margins. So they went there. The same process repeats itself and eventually Nikkor Steel in the year 1995 announced that they are going to do the sheet steel. It was that day in most of the uh, uh, most of the integrated mills board meeting were called and they asked the question, what do we do now? As you can see here, the disruption doesn't start with a small, another giant didn't come and catch it. It was a small kid who started hitting these giants. And this is what is called as disruption. A small startup would disrupt a large corporation. This is a natural process. You can apply it everywhere. If you look at Toyota, the same thing happened. Toyota entered the US market not with large cars. They said, we are going to give the cars to the, to the cheapest possible cars. And they said that we're going to look after a different segment of people. They said, we're going to give, the, give cars for the poor people. So they entered the market. Slowly, you see, they displaced the entire 
uh, General Motors and Fords had Fords had a serious problems when Toyota started eating up their market. Now, what is happening to Toyota? Toyota start was slowly getting disrupted by Hyundai and Daewoo. They started disrupting. Now Hyundai is being disrupted by Kia Motors. Slowly, you see this is a natural process and it happens. Maybe. Yeah. So when disruption causes us to innovate, so there are times when we continuously innovate to create disruption or to prevent ourselves from uh, disruption, being disrupted. But there are times when we need to innovate because disruption has been caused. And if I talk about COVID, COVID is really the best example. And that's also the topic for today that how do we deal with this disruption that's been caused by COVID and how do we emerge from it? So because of the situation where we are in, a lot of companies, a lot of companies where things were not allowed, you know, um, they had to innovate. They had to find new ways of working with people being at home, everybody distributed in order to make the best out of the situation. So if I talk about successful disruptors, right? I mean, talk about Amazon, talk about Uber. If you really look at all the big disruptors here, Airbnb is one of them. They have a couple of things that are in common there. I mean, they all went digital, you know, and not just they kept themselves dig digital, they all went digital while keeping a wider view on other business opportunities. They kept on innovating on, yes, we are digital, but how do we grow, grow from here? What do we do next? So all these companies are fully agile, not just ag agile at a team level, they're working with agility at scale. They're they, they are you know, the next gen companies that are talking about business agility, organizational agility. All these companies are making the most of the data and they all take security very, very seriously. So, and in order to do all four of those, in order to be, uh, you know, call, be a disruptive or have disruptive innovation, it's not easy. It's, it's quite challenging to be the next Amazon or the next Uber. So you need to have these things in place, that these four things, so digital, uh, be fully agile, make the most of data and you know, take security really seriously. So getting all that, then, then we link it to SAFE, right? We say SAFE is a very robust framework. It's built on all these best pra practices um, with the work of highly experienced consultants who've dealt with such complex situations in complex environments. And one of the things that I always like to stress on is continuous learning and innovation. We talk about Jimba walks, we talk about, you know, all these things about being agile, being, you know, um, ag agile at scale, because without knowing what to do next and without knowing what your customer wants, you, there'll be gaps in the market. And without that, you, you can neither disrupt nor innovate. So uh, moving on to the next slide now. So dealing with disruptive innovation. Now, with all these four things we talked about, it, if I talk about in terms of a framework, then it boils down to these four things, or there are more, but really rock solid. If we talk about then these four things are what come, come up, like leadership, we talk about strategic agility, we talk about managing systems, and there's entrepreneurial culture. And moving forward now from here, we'll focus on these four things. We'll focus on how these four things are intertwined and how one after the other, they help us to emerge from crisis. So the very first one that we are talking about now is leadership. So once again, I'd like you to take a time, take a minute to think, either raise your hand or put in your chat box, what do you think? I mean, if we talk about disruption from back many years ago when disruption started, right? I mean, printing press was a big disruption. Um, and then with all the companies now lately, uh, digital media was a big disruption, then Amazon, then Uber. And if we link at the leadership, if we talk about leadership throughout whenever disruption has happened, how, what's common in the leadership? So feel free to write in your chat window or raise your hands to share your view. So the question is, 
What is common in leadership when we talk about disruption? How has leadership emerged over time with disruption? Yeah, you're very right, Rajasri. So uh, Arjun Rajasri has responded saying, em embrace challenges, and that is very true. Leadership, it's, it's about embracing challenges. And leaders are visionary people, right? They're visionary people, they are community builders, and I see one more response, actively engage on fail fast approach. And that's really true. Actively, there, there's so much on leadership, right? Unlearned and relearning. Yes, very good. Thank you very much for, you know, these useful insights here. So, and these are all these things that are, you know, part and parcel of leadership. And I always think that leadership is the solid rock bottom of every successful organization. And when we talk about leadership, it's also the intent because leaders have to wear, wear so many different hats. We call it intent-based leadership, you know? Uh, and I see some more responses here, fast feedback loop. Yeah, that, that, is, that is one of uh, this. So leadership is really where it starts. Leadership, it, it, it all comes down on the shoulders of leaders on how to embrace those challenges, how to enable the, those fast feedback loops, how to feel fast and, you know, embrace that culture and also, you know, cascade that culture within your organization where people are not afraid of failures, right? And that brings us to our next slide, which is leaders focus on how to outlast the pandemic. One of the challenges, let's take an example of how medical sciences have evolved in treating people. So let's start with the fundamental concept of, and this is very much related to the COVID problem that we have today. First of all, what is a disease? Disease is something that will make you not to live in ease. We cannot have ease, that is disease. Opposite of ease is disease, comfort, discomfort. Similarly, ease, disease. Now, how would an individual know that they have a disease? It's only through symptoms. I've seen people telling, I'm suffering from diabetes, I'm suffering from blood pressure. No, these are just symptoms. They're not, they're not the disease, they're just symptoms. So one would know a problem only with symptoms. When you talk about symptoms, the first thing that you talk about is your cause of the symptom. That is, why are we seeing these symptoms? When you talk about cause, you always have two types of causes. One is called an external cause, one is called as an internal cause. The external cause is generally referred to as the exogenous cause in the medical world. And the one that is inside the human body is called as the endogenous cause. <coughs> now look at the external cause. There are so many people in this world suffering from COVID problem, yet there are so many doctors treating them. Fortunately, all the doctors cannot be affected. Or not, they're not affected. Only the pay, they're treating the patients, but they are not getting affected, which means to say that the outside environment is same for everybody. The market is same for every organization like Apple, uh, like Apple, Google, TCS, etc. But in spite of all these conditions, some organizations still continue to make some profit and do a wonderful job. There are quite a few organizations who fail, which means to say that since the market conditions are same for everybody, it's not the external cause. There has to be something called as the internal cause or the endogenous cause that is causing some organizations to fail or some of them to get affected by COVID-19. That means to say that you have to understand the root cause. This is what we call in our business world, in our corporate world, the root cause. To understand the root cause, you have to apply systems thinking in place. You have to understand the entire system of the individual. And that is what you call as the constitution or the business model in our corporate world. It's got to do something with the whole human body. Now, there is something called vitality, sorry, individuality. What's individuality? Now, among 10 people who are suffering from COVID, there are a few people who are not suffering from COVID or there is one person who's not suffering from COVID. That means to say that if you really want to focus on in, in, in individuality, you need to focus on what you have uncommon with others, not what you have common with others. So focus on something that is uncommon. So there has to be something different in this individual who is not suffering, or there has to be something different inside in this organization, which is not suffering any economic losses in spite of this global crisis. 
Now that is what is called a susceptibility that puts you in a position or in order to understand the susceptibility, you need to understand something called organization vulnerability, which means how is this organization placed to deal with these kind of challenging environments? How is a human body placed? In order for a human body to deal with COVID crisis, you need to focus on building immunity and that's what is called as vitality. So if you go and ask doctors, what do we do today? They say, build your immunity. Organizations also have to build immunity now. But how do we build immunity? Now, there is no measure to build immunity. There is no medical test to tell you are such a percentage immune. So there is only about symptoms again. So you'll have to keep on focusing on symptoms and make sure that you don't get those negative symptoms, which means you have built vitality in your organization. Hence, in this COVID world, one of the greatest things that the leaders have to focus is to build vitality or what you call as organizational uh, ability to deal with strategic changes. In short, we call it as strategic agility. Now, what is the norm? What's the uh, approach to do this? How can we approach these kind of changes? Well, let me give you a simple example for this. You all know Bajaj Auto Limited is one of the most uh, famous company in the world that manufactures maximum number of two wheelers in the world. In fact, it exports more outside India than it is being consumed in India. But the manufacturing happens in India. So the managing director of this company, Mr. Bajaj, once was doing yoga. He did excess yoga and sprained his back. He could not get up from the bed. He could not even go to the washroom and take a shower for 10 minutes. There was severe back in his pain. He immediately went to the doctor. The doctor did an MRI scan, looked at the reports and said, hey, you need to undergo a surgery. But he was afraid of the surgery because it was pretty engaged for him. So he goes back to his yoga teacher again and tells him that, I don't know what has happened, but there's a problem in my back. And the yoga teacher insisted him to come and he was afraid to go because the yoga teacher would make him bend, turn, and he was afraid of the, the pain that could cause. So when there was no other option, he goes to the yoga teacher. The yoga teacher gave him two hours of focused exercise. You don't believe at the end of two hours, this man had put his head, uh, he was standing upside down. And that's, a, that's, a, uh, that's what you call as Shirshasan in yoga. He was putting his head at below, the legs were at the top. The yoga teacher put about five kgs of weight on his leg and said, kick, the leg, kick this weight through your leg and the problem is resolved. After this two hours of rigorous exercise, he goes back to his car, gingerly opens the door and sits, and he finds it very comfortable. Within two days after taking rest, the pain is gone. So he was so excited that he called up his yoga teacher and asked him, what was the magic behind such kind of enterprise transformation that happened in his body? So the yoga teacher said that the medical system wanted to fix a structure in order to enable a function to walk. Whereas when you apply systems thinking and when you are to deal with such kind of crisis, you will have to enable a function, the structure will fall in place automatically. Let's take an example of teamwork. If you want to get a wonderful teamwork, should you focus on the team or should you focus on the work? You can't get 10 best cricket batsmen and create a huge cricket team out of it. It's not going to happen. You need to build a team, take an ordinary set of focus, focus on work. That's called as function. Focus on work. After some time, they develop themselves as a team and then you get teamwork. So when you are trying to do such kind of transformation in the post-COVID crisis, don't start changing the structure immediately. It's going to fail. You will have to enable functions and slowly the function will lead to a transformation in your structure. And that's how you can deal with the crisis. So looping into what Anand just said right so the, the first one we talked about was leadership and second second of was strategic agility so agility that we can adapt agility so gone are the days you know companies you remember that we used to or maybe it's happening in a lot of companies still uh, wherever i coach we change it but i do know that in traditional companies they set strategy for years strategy is set in stone. They, they set it for three to five years mm -hmm. and it doesn't matter what happens, they are set in their plans. Now, coming from 
when I go consult companies, I always advise my clients and I say, don't, don't do that. Strategy is meant to help you. You know, it should not be cast in iron. You, maybe you want to set a long-term strategy, of course, three years, fine. But define the strategy in a way which you relook at every now and then, set a, set a period, relook at your strategy and ensure that there's room to adapt and adapt without, you know, mercy or guilt. If there is a need to adapt, adapt. And that's, once again, links back to COVID. Now, companies where they had strategic agility, they adapted or they had to somewhere, but there are some companies that are thriving. Some just adapted to do the basic minimum, but some companies are thriving just because they had this component of strategic agility built in there. And there are various ways to define your strategy. And I think Anand in the next slide will discuss or uh, how to, you know, how can we define uh, strategic agility? Yeah, one of the ways of how you need to de deal with disruption or the kind of challenge we have is very diff these are concepts that have been picked up from the art of war. So these all these all, all strategies have come from the the wars that the mankind has fought back before. So there are four kinds of strategies that you could deal with. One is called as a defensive strategy. One is called as an offensive. The third one is called flanking, and the next one is called as a guerrilla strategy. Let's look at let's look at one by one. Who is the leader? Who was the leader in the cola industry? It was undoubtedly Coke. Coke was the leader. Now, whatever decision Coke would take, it would always defend it, its leadership. Now, Coke increases the price by 100%. The decision is defended by its leadership. You can only apply defensive strategy provided you are a market leader and you don't have competition. <coughs> As said that, you know, organization startups are just eating away the businesses. So, how did Pepsi deal with this? Pepsi is a very intelligent company. How did they deal with this? Pepsi started off creating what's called, applying something called as offensive strategy. Now offensive is opposite of defensive. So instead of directly competing with Coke, Pepsi introduced something called 7up. And that's white in color. It's opposite of color of Coke. That's called a defensive strategy. After the bit of disrupted, they introduced their, the real product called Pepsi. They introduced Pepsi. That's called flanking strategy. Now, what did they tell when they introduced Pepsi? They said, hey, I'm not a Coke because I'm sweeter than the Coke. And they said, hey, I'm not a 7-Up because I have a different color. They placed it strategically after some time. And you see, they were able to deal with, or they were able to capture a segment of their customers. A few customer segments were captured by Pepsi. In the market, there are a few market leaders who don't care for anything because they have their own market. And one such example is Red Bull. Red Bull doesn't care for anybody. They have their own market. What Nidhi was trying to explain in the previous slide is if organizations cannot change their strategy quickly, probably you will have to lose the market to your competitor. Yeah. Somebody else will come and disrupt you after some time. Yeah. So it's important to understand that Without strategic agility, it's not possible to deal with disruptions. So I can I can actually I can actually give an example on that. So if we talk about this COVID, which is once again a very extreme example, but restaurant business just died completely. And not in one country, but throughout everywhere in the world, restaurant business just died. The only thing that worked was takeaway. But there were a lot of people, big restaurants, they couldn't, you know, they couldn't incur the cost and they were kind of going through a very difficult time. So there's one restaurant here, they actually looked at the gap in the market. That's here where I live in the neighborhood. They looked at the gap in the market, they quickly studied what people require and they quickly adapted their strategy. They thought, if not that, maybe we can do this. So what they did was they fly it, they put flyer uh, around in the neighborhood saying, we know you're all going through tough times. Children are at home. You need to focus on their home learning. You need to focus on their work. You know what? We'll provide you custom food. We'll provide you custom breakfast, custom lunch. We'll pack it and we'll do it for the entire week. So this is our list of things that we can make for you. But if you want more, just write it. And they were this big of an 
empty column where we could write what we wanted to order. We just needed to order a week in advance, which I thought was a blessing, you know. We were all very busy with home learning, uh, with our children, work increased, all these call times, everything became very stressful. And then going out, buying, buying groceries, cleaning the house, everything was, you know, got, got too much. So from that perspective, I think it's really good. And their business flourished in this time because they were offering custom services to people and people anyways make menu for a week in advance and they could help people. So they really came in with, with uh, a mindset that we're here to help people. And that as an effect also helped their business. And they are one of those who, even though restaurant business is in crisis, so they're not. And that's what I mean when I talk about strategic agility, that, you know, not set in cast in iron, just go with the flow and just adapt where needed. So third point, so we've, we've talked about leadership, we've talked about strategic agility. Now, third point that we want to address today, which is another thing how to, uh, another point, component of overcoming the crisis is manage systems. Don't manage your people. Just believe that the people you've hired are good. You know, that's why we hired them, right? They're good, they're capable of doing good work, but focus on the system. Not just one component of the system, you know, think of the system in its entirety. And um, once again, SAFE is really big on systems, right? It's, it's, it comes from the experience gathered from various consultants. So if I talk about credit card, for example, credit card, there are various systems associated to from the inception of when a phone call goes to somebody to buy a credit card, all the way to when the customer receives the credit card and starts using it. There are so many systems underlying supporting that. How do you ensure that those systems are talking to each other and collaborating with each other? How do you manage that overall as one system? That's where um, what it takes to ensure that you're dealing with the crisis or you're dealing with um, the emergencies that, you know, because if you, if you just look at one system, they will become selfish, they'll become rotten. So the key is to entire, to manage the system in its entirety. Um, so, yes, thank you. Let's start talking about how SAFE can play an important role in dealing with business agility. So as Nidhi explained, it's important for us to understand how we support our business to become agile. It's not that we respond as an IT team, respond to changes quickly. If our response doesn't add any business value, then we have a serious problem in the way of what we are delivering. Essentially, SAFE is a framework that has evolved over a period of time. It's an amalgamation of multiple schools of thought. At the, at the essential SAFE layer, you talk about teams working in SAFE with short iterations and evolving the requirements required, evolving the design as required, giving demos, integrating as soon as possible, which leads to the concept of continuous exploration of ideas, continuously integrating the ideas, building new uh, opportunities, and finally pushing it to production and getting quick feedback. So the DevOps culture lives in this something called a continuous delivery pipeline. SAFE also introduces the concept of customer centricity. It's not that it was not there in SAFE. Now it's been very specifically identified. And we also have tools to deal with customer centricity and we call it as design thinking. We use a lot of design thinking concepts to build in, uh, build in the concept and culture of customer centricity. It also gives you an opportunity to do with large systems. If you have to build large systems, obviously the challenges with subsystem engineering, subsystem integrations are huge. SAFE gives you an option of how to build large systems in an iterative, innovative way. Of course, building in, built in quality is maintained. You have to take care of regulatory requirements. And you also have to make sure that you continuously test your non-functional requirements, which eventually leads to your portfolio, where SAFE prescribes a lean portfolio management principles that facilitates the art of dealing with quick changes, which is called strategic agility. And how do we build your portfolio, building your vision, and making sure that 
you develop concepts which with the support to the innovation accounting model it says don't build your product to validate it build a minimum viable product validate in the market and if the if it is true proceed and build the complete product all these aspects are built in safe and safe has seven core competencies now starting with lean agile leadership team and technical agility agile product delivery lean portfolio management enterprise solution delivery and the two cultural based new competencies introduced called continuous learning culture and organizational agility the next part about is the last part that uh, nidhi spoke about is the entrepreneurship unless until we build an entrepreneur culture it's not possible to survive in organizations these are a couple of quotes from the ceo of microsoft satya nadella and he says our industry doesn't respect tradition it only respects innovation and he says one of the key things in the tech business in particular is to is that you need to be able to push beyond boundaries how is it possible how is safe enabling this and if you can see these are aspects that will help us to emerge from the post covid era organizations who are innovative and organizations who can push beyond their limits are the organizations who can survive and if you look at something called as the entrepreneur culture safe has a has a dimension in its competency one of its competency that talks about converting the entire organization into a set of innovative people everybody should start thinking of innovation it's not just about innovation you'll have to try innovation is not a noun innovation is a verb you have to try a lot of dirty prototypes to get the real uh, solution and when you try these prototypes it's not that you try in your labs you'll have to go and empathize with your customers that's what is called go see that's the concept of kemba and if you want to be innovative stop making the statement let's build the product first time the correct product i think that's not going to work anymore we are trying to build complex systems experimentation feedback is the key and as you know most experiments fail the sooner you fail the better is your ability to innovate in the part of innovation there is also an important aspect of pivot without mercy or guilt that means as you start building an idea if the market and the customers say that this idea is not feasible if it's not business viable you have to immediately stop it you have to learn how to pivot it without mercy and guilt if you can apply all this you create something called as an innovation riptide in your organization and that innovation riptide is where you have your portfolio coming up with new ideas you have your train developing these new ideas and there is something like a innovative innovation tide that starts in your organization but in order to do that what's more required is a concept of an orthopinal culture in the organization you have to work like a small network however you have seen that structures are built in organizations now and these structures will kill the entrepreneur culture in the organization john b cotter in his book called accelerate says that you have to build a dual operating system an operating system with a set of people who work like a startup where the focus is speed of innovation and a a hierarchical structure that's focused on efficiency and stability and he says only when you have these two it's when organizations can thrive in this post covid or the post the digital era especially in the post covid era and how does safe help it safe creates a framework safe has multiple uh, opportunities to create a culture of entrepreneurship you have something called an agile release train and this agile release train kills silos and create a kind of a startup culture however you have your various levels for stability and management so safe acts as a medium to build this dual operating system and this is a key for the next generation organizations to evolve so this is our this is our penultimate slide so the question here is what next and what is really next so the next important aspect that we need to focus is on as nidhi said leadership leadership should be a intent based leadership only when you have an intent based leadership you can evolve into one of the most important needs of the post covid era 
learning how to deal with from microeconomics to macroeconomics strategic agility strategic agility agility to move quickly at an organizational uh, strategies is the key to kind of take your disruption as a leader for prosperity as a ladder for prosperity sorry it's a ladder for prosperity the third point we spoke about is manage systems not people give people the authority because gravity does not differentiate anyone whether you are a small company or a big company covid doesn't differentiate anybody it just disrupts and finally your entrepreneurial culture is what will help us to be a part of innovation and grow ability to take quick decisions ability to go to the market ability to work with customers and deal will take us to the next level in the organization so in summary these are the four important aspects and these are the next important focus and in between you can have safe as a framework to deal with no i guess what so with so the whole point was that we discussed about main aspects that can help us emerge after crisis and we wanted to finish by 12:45 so that we could do a small q and a session so we time boxed it and i'm quite glad to say we've achieved our time box so now yeah feel free to raise your hand ask your questions or put your questions in the chat box and on that probably a question here i work for a company in a country which has a strong strong social security how can we make people realize to accept changes that's a quite an interesting one it's it's very difficult to accept fundamental changes it's very difficult so let's take the example of the medical system again in india at least there are different types of medical systems and every country has its own local medical system however the two major medical systems that you can talk about is the ayurveda and the allopathy in india ayurveda is a systemic treatment whereas allopathy is a symptomic treatment they just treat the symptom it's exo- external cause is what i tell you but treating a symptom you're not addressing the root cause the change is not going to be permanent if you want to change you will have to change the system you have to get to the endogenous cause you have to address the cause internally and that is what ayurveda does but ayurvedic treatments take a very long time because it has to go and fix the structure it will go you have to enable a function you have to take the medicine and then it will fix the structure over a period of time this is exactly what we need to do in a country that strongly bond with some social security you cannot abruptly impose changes on people self realization is important so you will have to create an environment where people feel voluntarily to participate in the change and then experience the change once they see the positivity of the change automatically you see things will fall in track you will have to go but it's a challenge it takes time it's not easy eventually it will happen you need to have a dedicated focus for this i quite agree with you and i think it's a really good question so thank you rajesh shri arjun for asking it i think it's a very good question and that is also a challenge that we face every time right that um also when we talk about agile it's like how much is enough how do we make this change happen when people are not ready to change so i really really agree strongly agree to anand because people need to realize it's all about self realization they need to realize that the change needs to happen and second i'd also say cultivating the mindset for change and once again then it's about goes on leadership how to cult- be a role model yourself that you are visionary and you are willing to change and how do you cultivate that mindset through the organization but once again if it's systematic if it's really necessary to change yes but sometimes you can't change and i can relate it to a situation when i consult or when i coach in companies a question comes back every time like how much documentation is enough you always say in agile less documentation no documentation but how much is enough really and that's when i say you know what if it's required by government or if it's required by law we have to document it you know so how much is necessary you will know if you study your surrounding but what's not necessary scrap it so yeah yeah so good to question. alter the belief system of the people that's deep embedded in their in their mind so 
So there is an, there is a very nice way what Mr. Bajaj always says. He says that if you want to deal with the mindset, like how we if if you want to deal with teamwork, he said work with the team. Work start with work, not with teams. Similarly, he says if you want to deal with the mindset, don't deal with the mind, deal with the set. He says you have to set a extraordinary goal, world class goal. And he says, in order to meet that world class goal, you have to build a world class infrastructure for it. And he says, set your capabilities, set your resources, everything in, align in alignment with that goal. And he says, the last one is very important. He says, set aside all your distractions for it. And then he says, it definitely works. So don't focus on mind, focus on set. Once the set is done, the mind will automatically change. And then you are to achieve a mindset change. What's yeah. your opinion in terms of promoting a framework where it's safe to embrace agility? I think it's a great idea to start looking at safe as an option. Simple reason, it's not a dream that somebody had. It's built on some scientific management processes. It's built on agile development, systems thinking and lean product development. Lean product development was again evolved by Toyota and Toyota has done a significant progress in the way how they have changed the market, how they changed the automobile industry itself. So when it is built on those frameworks and when we are applying it there, why not we take it? We take so much from factory systems, so much from manufacturing and applied, you can also take this and apply it. If you really want to see the success, you have to do the right things. By taking a framework and not respecting it, you won't achieve the required result. Do the right things. Well, it is tough to do the right things, I agree, but unless you do, you can't achieve anything. Yes, we are all humans. I totally agree with you, uh, Rajshree. I agree with you. We are all humans and we all have our, our professional and personal goals. But somewhere you have to listen to your heart. Somewhere you have to listen to your heart and you have to move. That's it. So if you are in an organization, uh, if you are, a, we always had this saying in English, right? A square peg in a round hole. If you are like that, it's quite difficult to live. It's quite difficult. You will have to learn the art of how to deal with changes and then get into a place where you feel you love your job. Only when you love your job, you start seeing innovation at your place. Otherwise, it's like a forced inhibition on us. And we don't like being forced. I believe COVID will result in, in more work from home instead of face-to-face. -face. Agile and safe always promoted face-to-face -face communication. How can you still do this with people and remote? It's a great question. I have always thought about it. It's a great question. Well, Agile software development always believed in doing face-to-face -face development. We always, one of the Agile principles says that the best way to communicate to and within the team is face-to-face -face conversations. But these are extreme conditions where you really cannot face-to-face. -face. This is the time when leaders have to start showing trust on their teams. This is the time when team members have to build a trust. What is an agile team? An agile team is not set of people having a, having a focused goal. That's a old, uh, that's a old uh, definition. The new definition is an agile team is a set of folks who care for each other's fate. Of course, in caring for each other's fate, we care for our customer's fate. So it is important for us to understand that we are all remote. We cannot come face to face for, I don't know for how many next few months, but two main focus here is trust and sense of purpose. If you do not have a sense of purpose today, you're lost in your own world. I think the most important a role of a leader in today's world is constantly share the sense of purpose. Why are we doing what we are doing? Align everybody to a common objective, the sense of purpose, and of course, build trust and show trust, live trust every day. Only when you live trust every day, that's when you will start seeing the positives of, of being trustful. I feel that's the whole uh, idea behind it. The yeah. HR teams have to play a very critical role now. Yeah. No, I, I quite agree. And I think it is it is definitely the question of the now, right? Uh, that um, 
I mean, yes, agile and safe always promoted face-to-face -face communication, but let's face it, the reality was that there were distributed teams. And that's why in safe, we had BI planning where everybody came together, but rest of the times distributed teams were working uh, together remotely. But now it's extreme condition. I think we, we have some sort of, uh, we have tried to, uh, we have quickly innovated and all the teams have gone, uh, you know, video conferencing, but there's more to come. You know, we are video conferencing, we are trying to replicate face-to-face -face communication by video conferencing, but it's got its own challenges really. So we'll have to innovate further to give it more of a, you know, reality, re real situation where teams can, can elaborate even more effectively. There are new things coming up. There are new virtual offices coming up that really make it very realistic for people. And there is more to come. Innovation doesn't stop. This is the first step. We are in the middle of a crisis and we, we, we've started working remotely with those remote help of remote tools, but we still need to, you know, target those challenges and that will come even more, more is going to evolve, evolve further if we follow a proper framework. Yeah. I think the another important aspect that all of us have to do as individuals, as teams, as organizations is in getting into something called routines. Right? We always have a question, why does the army, why does the Indian army show, how is that they can show so much of patriotism to the nation? because they have a routine where they sing the national anthem every day, irrespective of the climate conditions. And that routine brings in a lot of discipline in us. And that discipline takes the, the current condition of being isolated into a different level where all of us can feel that we are still working as a team. I think having routines is very important in today's world. I've seen a lot of posts on Facebook and LinkedIn which says, Let's get into some routines. But what is a routine? You have to do certain jobs certain, at certain times of the day. Spend about 45 to 50 minutes for a physical walk, physical exercise. You can walk inside the house. You don't have to go for a gym and then spend your time there taking risk walk. Spend some time reading books, refresh your knowledge, focus on your work, and then relax. I think if you can get into this of a routine, you can still come out of this COVID situation. And that's exactly what SAFE talks about. Getting into a routine of iterations, PIs, demos, and that routine builds discipline and can deliver value to customers. All right, so we've got one minute left and uh, we've got a response from Sandra. Um, I'm not sure if all attendees can see it, so I'll read it out. So thank you for the answers. I agree with you in line with face-to-face. -face, I would um, have like, okay. Um, yeah. So in line to face-to-face, -to -face, um, it, it was nice, but allowed, you're allowed to talk. <laughs> so um, yeah, so I think that's also a feedback for us. Uh, for next time, it would, be have, it would be nice. And this is one of the challenges we face really, right? All the time that open communication with everybody's videos on. This is a recent communication I faced with one of the clients uh, where the teams are talking to each other, but they're not, uh, the, everybody's videos off. So how we do it. So Sandra, thank you for bringing that up. That's one of the challenges. And like I said, we are still evolving and we still need to evolve. So yes, so we need to wrap up now. So I would like to say thank you very much for everybody's uh, participation here. Thank you very much for your um, question and answers. Um, Anand, would you like to say something? So it, it's an honor for me to host a class with Nidhi. We're trying to focus on uh, participants who are working in the Singapore time zone. So if you have any questions on our upcoming class, feel free to drop an email to Anup. And Anup is from our learning team and he'll be able to uh, give you convincing answers about upcoming class what is this class all about and then if there is an opportunity for us to share knowledge with you we'll be glad to do that yeah right thank you very much everybody it was a pleasure being here talking about the current situation we are in and uh, i hope to you know inter be interacting with all of you also soon thank you very much so thank you very much for your time and i wish you all the all the uh, the best and be safe and 
learn continuously learn thank you thanks bye bye